youngest of eight children. I grew up in a very small, simple home just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But I didn't know was that my family was poor. Not until I got into the first grade. And what happens when you're poor and you enter into elementary school and you're on free and reduced lunch, you have to go to the principal's office every Monday to get your meal tickets for the week. Is that puts you at the end of the lunch line. You're the last person or the last few people who have to sit down at the girls' table or the boys' table when you're in first grade. So all of us that were on free and reduced lunch, we sat in the overflow table. And we would look at each other, embarrassed, ostracized, feeling isolated, alone. But we also build a community of friendship every Monday we would sit together. And that was my critical experience, and I carried that like a backpack. And I, every time I saw some sort of thing happen to one of my friends who was in my group, or you know, I would just I would feel that I knew what it was like to feel like that. And I carried a lot of experiences with me through the years. I would hear about things in the world. I would hear about um, you know issues that my friends were having, and I would just keep putting in my backpack. And one time when I was in about the fifth grade, my sister was telling me how she had this roommate who joined the Peace Corps to go help people in Africa. I put it in my backpack, went off to high school, finished high school, went off to college, and tried to do what I could in the small community, got really involved, and just did what I could. But then a Peace Corps recruiter showed up at my campus, had the table set up, all the pretty flyers and everything, and I was like, yeah, the Peace Corps. I think I wanted to do that. And I walked up to her, asked her a few questions about Peace Corps, and I said, when are you going to be here until? She said, I'll be here until 4 o'clock. I went, left her, skipped classes the rest of the day in college, filled out my application, put it in an envelope, and handed it to her at 4 p.m. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest where I didn't have a lot of exposure to the rest of the world and the big ideas. I learned most of what I thought might be cool to do outside of my small town in the pages of National Geographic and the Discovery Channel. But I learned in this small town what a community was, what strong eth ethics of work, work ethics were in the farms and the fields that I got to contribute in in my teenage years, on the baseball diamonds, and the friendships I had at the dinner tables um, with my family. But I knew I wanted to do something much bigger with my life than anything that my small town had to offer. And I didn't know what that would be, but when I got into college and I was going to the University of Arizona, I started by joining a fraternity. And I became a leader in that fraternity. And I got an internship with a U.S. Senator and started helping constituents with their problems. And I met this, this change maker, this amazing woman by the name of Hilly Gottlieb in Tucson, Arizona, who was doing some amazing grassroots work in the community. And all of these things were kind of culminating between my junior and senior year when my roommate, the president of our fraternity, said, I just got back from summer interning with Ted Kennedy. And you know what we're going to do? We're joining the Peace Corps. He sold me instantly because he had taken the time to learn about what the Peace Corps was and he knew that it wasn't just the right idea for him but it was the right idea for me because he knew what I wanted to do was something beyond my wildest expectations and Peace Corps met those and exceeded them. So I get the letter in the mail in my senior year of college I got in. I got into the Peace Corps. I mean, this is something I've been thinking about for like 10 years. I can't believe I got in. A couple weeks later, I get a letter. Niger. I'm not even sure what that is. And I got my letter, and I ran to the bar with Skyler, and we, sit down the, we sat down at the, at the uh, bar because we knew we were going to want to celebrate. And I got to open it up, and it said Niger. And this is before Google. So it took us quite a while to go figure out <laughs> where the heck Niger was. But it was the beginning of 
something that was very, very special. That's the love of nature. I found the design. Brett and I, that's where we met in the Peace Corps. But it would be years before we would actually see each other again. I served in the far west in a little village called Cabefo. And I served about 1,000 kilometers, about two and a half days from where Virginia served in a village called Torrey Alta. And although we did come together, where as all volunteers do in the capital city, we shared a couple of beers, warm, cheap beer, <laughs> played pool, got to know each other a little bit, but we went off to do their work. The work that I did was in a little village called Cabeco, and it had recently been settled by former slaves. Slavery in 2000? Slavery is alive and rampant around the world, and it's something maybe more lightly called indentured servitude. But in 1960, slavery was abolished in Africa. But it wasn't until 2003 where it was actually criminalized. They prohibited it in 1999, just before I got there. But essentially, the village and the community that I lived in were trying to figure out how to live outside of servitude. They were trying to figure out how to build a community um, and anything they could do to just survive. But now they're this ostracized population that's living really out in the middle of nowhere. And it was hot. I am telling you, this is the edge of the Sahara Desert. It was hot. You know like when you go into a sauna and there's a sign outside the door and it says, do not stay here for longer than 15 minutes? I stayed there for two and a half years. <laughs> and it was, it's one of the biggest lessons I've learned was during the heat of the day, when it's 11 to 4 p.m., don't make any life just changing decisions because it's really hard and it's really stressful. And I carry that same lesson. But moreover, I also learned a very important lesson where, you know, there are a lot of days that I wanted to give up, that I wanted to go home to Doritos, a cold shower. You know, I knew that a, 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 you know, a life of an American was literally a, le a resignation letter and a flight away. But when I looked around at my community and they had nothing, nothing, there was like, the name was, the village of name was called Kabepo, which means abyss, a tree, and there's one. But when I got there, there, that tree wasn't even there anymore. So as I'm sitting there feeling sorry for myself in the middle of the Sahara Desert, or on the edge of the Sahara Desert, I realized these people live here forever. They're always going to be here. And when there seems like there's no resources and that there's no possibilities, when your resources seem limited, they're in fact limitless. If I did anything, if I woke up and got myself out the door with clothes on and tried to do anything, one thing a day, I knew that I could really help and really try to transform what was happening in that community. What really got me inspired about Peace Corps was like, how far are you willing to go? That's what, they, that's what they used to say. How far are you willing to go to make a difference? And so, you know, by being inspired by a small town and not knowing what even could be a possibility about getting out there and doing something, I was like, I want to go as far as you can take me. I'll, how, how far? I'll go as far as you can. So they sent me to Niger, and then they start, sent me as far out as they sent volunteers. And I ended up in this village called Kori Hausa. And they were not this village like Virginia's who didn't know how to live and work together. They had figured out so many things already because for hundreds of years they had come together and farmed the land and this family was the butcher and this one was the baker and this was the midwife and this was the roof maker and the brick maker and they had divided all the labor that they needed to be as self-sustaining as they possibly could because there wasn't any government cars going over there, there weren't any NGOs doing business projects out there. It was a 12 mile walk from the nearest paved road, which I 
did 42 or so times, and Virginia always asked me if I wanted to do half marathon. I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I did that and flip flops. 42 times. <clears throat> um, but, you know, what they quickly realized was they didn't need my help as an agriculture extension agent. They've been doing this for 200 years. Their land is no longer viable because they have to, every time they have four or five or six kids, they have to divide their land four or five or six times. And now they're coming up with some serious problems around the year 2001. They don't have, they can't divide their land five times amongst five sons anymore. They need to take advantage of something else. They need to send their kids out to make money. And they knew it was through education. And they saw a Peace Corps volunteer coming into the community as their ticket for the future. So I came in there thinking I had a bag of tricks for agriculture. And they quickly said, Brent, it only rains about five times a year here. We're not interested in this. We're interested in you giving us that key to our future, which is help us build a school in this village. And I thought, you know, I don't have any money. We don't have any cell phones, we don't have the internet. I can't reach out to my family and friends. I can't go anywhere. So what I saw as a great opportunity was I could bridge the divide between the local leadership and the local government. Both could respect me, both could see what I was trying to do, and we were able to build a school in that village. And when I went back in 2006, there were more classrooms, and there was a health center. And they had figured out a way to transport their kids to the middle school down the road by Oxford. And things had literally changed. And I spent the last 10 years of my life trying to replicate that experience, learn from it, and, and grow. If I'm only going to get up and do one thing a day, I'm thinking there's no sustainability in this. How am I going to help prepare these folks to be able to make decisions for themselves in the future? There was no school there. And I decided, you know, I should build a school. And what we started off as a thatch classroom became a concrete classroom. It became three classrooms, and now it's four concrete structured classrooms. Over the years, we've built and built and built that community. And what that experience did was gave me the ambition and the social entrepreneurship skills and the business acumen to be able to start something like Educate Tomorrow that helps thousands of kids who have never adopted, kids who are abused, abandoned, and neglected in our communities to help them get to higher education and uh, become their own leaders in their community. And we've done this, we've been able to replicate what I did in my village with the community several hundred times in several hundred different ways from Haiti to Nepal, India, Nicaragua, uh, Mali, Malawi, Senegal, in many, many countries we've done this. And it worked by empowering and listening to the community and, and having them tell you what they need has been able to work. And we've been able to do it with kids who are aging out of foster care, who with a community of support can do the same thing. They have, if they have the resources and if they have their input in what their success might look like, they can really do great things. About five, six years after Peace Corps, I would once again meet Brett in Florida at a wedding of our friends who were also in the Peace Corps. And again, we would sit down and drink cheap, warm beers and play pool and talk about all the things we had just shared with you. And in meeting Brett again for the second time, I realized that if this guy is willing to live in a mud hut with no running water, no electricity and is really passionate about education, we can be partners for life. And I realized that she's, she looks pretty good at a dress when she's all cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> and that she's the only Peace Corps officer I've ever seen that not only left that Peace Corps service but continued to pour her heart and soul into her village. But the story that I want to leave you with is a story about Mariana. 
Mariama was a small, was a neighbor girl. She's you pictured here in the red coat. This is how I knew her. This is what it, she looked like when I first got to that village. I knew that if I could do anything, if I could build a school for that young girl, imagine her possibility. But because I stay committed to my service with Peace Corps and stay committed to my village, I was able to see that. And last year, she was selected by the Niger government as the only female delegate for the 400 and 800 meter international race in China. And I know for a fact, absolutely without a question in my mind, that Maryam would not have had that opportunity had I not served in the Peace Corps. So when we say, you know, the corner office can wait, put the suit away, take it off, put it away, and think about Mariama, or who's going to be your Mariama, because she needs you. So when I know, when I look at the depth of like everything I've ever done, <laughs> where I get my courage, where I get my strength, and where I learned who I was as a person, is right here at Peace Corps. <laughs>